I woke up this morning, I just had the word the Lord gave me, come and see. And uh, you know, that's taken from John's Gospel, uh, chapter 4, when the, the situation uh, with the lady at the well, and also it's taken from the beginning of John's Gospel, when Jesus called his first disciples to him, and he said, come and see. So I came to meet the Lord Jesus Christ. I met the Lord Jesus many years ago, 19 years of age, and life was good for me. I lived in a very loving family, and uh, you know, I really enjoyed being a nurse. It was great. I had loads of friends and a good social life, but I just knew there was something that was missing. And when I went to a, a, a meeting just like this, but it was in the evening, uh, one night in the city of Cardiff, and I heard that Jesus Christ was God's son, and how he loved me, and how I could have my sins forgiven, and how could I, I could have a fresh start. You know, I decided that I was up for it. My best friend had gone to university. She was always top of the class. I wasn't. And in university, she'd become a Christian. And when I heard that message of Jesus, I made the greatest decision of my life that I wanted to follow him. And I tell you, over 40 years later, I can honestly say there's never been one day that I've been disappointed to know Jesus. Mm. And the message of the week really is, come and see. And by doing that with fun activities, it really works today. I think you'll agree with me that the uh, United Kingdom, Wales, we've become very secular. And many people now, like the young ladies have said, are, are very unsure what the Christian faith is all about. Just two days ago, I finished a fun event in the village of my birth, Trihavud, in the Rhondda Valley. And I want to tell you, we had hundreds of people come. And because I know the village and I know the people, among the hundreds that came, only one was a believer. But I'm so pleased, you know, that many people really opened up to the gospel. You never know, see, I tell you what, there is a, a definite a law in things, what you sow, you reap. Mm -hmm. Now, 30 years ago in that village, a very good friend and myself, we did a kids club. And now these 30 years later, these kids are now 38 and 40, and they bring in their children to these fun events. So the thing is not to quit and not to give up. I tell you, God has great things in store for Hollyhead. He has great things in store for Wales. He has great things in store for you. And I want to encourage you with all my heart, whatever you do, don't miss out on this week. Because I tell you what, you'll be sorry if you do, because you'll miss out on seeing how God touches people. Because we are living in a very secular situation where it's more difficult to bring people to church, and we need to be out in the community. Now, I'm talking from a standpoint of being an evangelist, a pioneer evangelist for over 30 years. So I think I've got a voice to speak because over 30 years, every year, I tell you I've been out in the community in, in the UK. And I want to tell you being out in the community really works because people are looking for an answer. And it's not true that everywhere is so hard. It's not true that people don't want to know. But I tell you, how will they know unless they hear the message? Anyway, let's turn to this wonderful book, God's Book, the Bible. John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 35. The following day, John was again standing with two of his disciples as Jesus walked by. And John looked at him and declared, Look, there is the Lamb of God. When John's two disciples heard this, they followed Jesus. Jesus looked around and saw them following. What do you want? He asked them. They replied, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? And Jesus said, come and see. He said it was about four o'clock in the afternoon when they went with him to the place where he was staying and they remained with him the rest of the day. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of these men who heard what John said and then followed Jesus. And Andrew went to find his brother Simon. Isn't that wonderful? The first thing he did when he met Jesus, he went to find his brother. And Andrew went to find his brother Simon and told him, we have found the Messiah, which means Christ. Then Andrew brought Simon to meet Jesus. I think that's fabulous. He actually met Jesus. He went to find his brother, and then he took him to Jesus. Isn't that wonderful? And Andrew brought Simon to meet Jesus. And looking intently at Simon, Jesus said, 
Your name is Simon, son of John, but you will be called Cephas, which means Peter. And the next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee, and he found Philip and said to him, Come, follow me. And Philip was from Bethesda and from Peter's hometown. And Philip went to look for Nathanael and told him, We have found the very person, Moses, and the prophets wrote about. His name is Jesus, the son of Joseph, Joseph from Nazareth. And Nazareth exclaimed, Nathanael, can anything good come from Nazareth? Come and see for yourself, Philip replied. And, they approached, and, they, and as they approached, Jesus said, Now you is a genuine son of Israel, a man of complete integrity. And it goes on. But I think that's wonderful. The first disciples, and now we know that some of the disciples of John the Baptist, they heard about Jesus. Jesus said, come and see. And then Andrew then went and found his brother. He took him to Jesus. And then we know that, that uh, then Jesus said, come to follow me, and Philip came. And then the th first thing Philip did was went to find his friend Nathaniel. And all of us have a circle of influence in our lives. I remember going to a church once, because I'd been an Elam evangelist for a long time, and I remember going to an Elam church when I was young, and uh, they said to me, oh, you know, it's so difficult because we're all third generation, generation Christians. What they meant by that was everybody they knew was a Christian. So I said, well, do you put petrol in the tank of the car to go to the shop? Surely, you know, we can reach someone. So circle of influence. And you know, you have a circle of influence around you and I or for me. And you can reach people that I'll never be able to reach and vice versa. Because what I love is God made us unique. You know, we are absolutely unique. And we are special and of great value. As someone prayed this morning, in the hand of God, great value. In fact, the Bible tells us in the book of Psalms that one individual is of such great worth that even the wealth in the whole world couldn't buy one. And the Bible tells us God is for us. So we have an incredible message the Christian faith is an incredible message. And I want to tell you it's a message that we need to tell from the north to the south, to the east to the west of our nation and in the continent of Europe. I tell you the truth, I felt the Lord spoke to me just about two and a half years ago now, afresh, and uh, laid upon my heart the importance of, by God's help, <coughs> helping us to help to mobilize the church in being out there in the community telling the message. Because I tell you the truth, I don't know if in 10 years' time we'll have the same freedom we have today. We'll be going out this afternoon in the festival. We'll be inviting people to come to a Christian event in, in the, uh, the Boston uh, meeting. But I tell you, I don't know whether we will uh, in years to come have that same freedom. So I tell you, God help us. If on our watch that we don't tell the message of Jesus now, we owe it to our children. We owe it to our grandchildren. We cannot be asleep now. We, I tell you, it's too late for the church to be asleep. And I want to tell you, love looks like something. The Christian faith looks like something. I heard a young pastor speak in the Victory Church in Cumbran recently. And Clyde spoke and he said, a church that is not on mission is not a church. Because we were called to be a movement, to, pull, to move forward in the things of God and the kingdom of God. And I tell you, everybody needs to take part. And what's lovely is we've all got different gifts. And I notice that nobody ever asks me to play the piano. I tell you, Becky, she played there with such anointing and she made it look so easy as she led us in worship this morning. And I notice that nobody ever asks me to do the catering or the organization. Because, you know, we've got all different gifts. I remember once with our school of evangelism, and we had this event, because we always have an event, so the lifelong of events. And we had this event in West Wales somewhere, and we had, you know, two weeks event, and so many people were supposed to come one week, and so many the other, and less people came the first week, and more people came the second week, and we only had, like, accommodation for 40-something, and 72 turned up. I remember saying to my team, I said, we've got a problem. But, oh, it's a good problem. We've got 72, not 46. But I tell you, the caterers wasn't very happy. 
And you know, that's all I can say. The caterers actually were from North Wales and they were gorgeous ladies, but I only ever saw them once after. And I remember having to go to them and say, oh, ladies, I'm so sorry. 72 people have turned up. It was very embarrassing. So I tell you what, my friends said on our team, Adeline, you will never be doing that again to us. And I love the Bible, and I know that you love it as well. I know that I'm in a Bible-believing church this morning where people love Jesus, and you want to see God move in your nation, don't you? Absolutely, we do, and our area. And then you look at the wonderful account in John's Gospel, chapter 4, and reading from verse 4. I'll, I'll read some verses and skip some. So not that I, I, I want to skip the word of God. I love the word of God, but I don't want to go on forever. So John 4, verse 4. So Jesus had to go through Samaria on the way. Eventually came to the Samaritan village of Sychar, near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat wearily beside the well about noontime. Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, please give me a drink. Verse 8. He was alone at the time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. And the woman was surprised, for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. So she said to Jesus, you're a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? And Jesus replied, if you only knew the gift God has for you and who you are speaking to, you would ask me, and I would give you living water. But sir, you don't have a rope or bucket, she said, and this well is very deep. Where would you get this living water? And besides, do you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he and his sons and his animals enjoyed? And Jesus replied, anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again. But those who drink the water I give him will never thirst again. It will become a fresh bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. Please, sir, the woman said, give me this water. Then I'll never be thirsty again. And I won't have to come here to get water. Now the conversation goes on. Go and get your husband, Jesus told her. I don't have a husband, the woman replied. And Jesus said, you're right. You've had a husband, for you've had five husbands. And you aren't even married to the man you're living with now. You certainly spoke the truth. So the woman said, you must be a prophet. So tell me, why is it that the Jews insist that worship, that at Jerusalem is the only place of worship, while we Samaritans claim it is here at Mount Gesebel? But our ancestors worshipped. Jesus replied, Believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans know very little about the one you worship, while we Jews know all about him, for salvation comes through the Jews. But the time is coming, indeed, it's here now, when true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. And the Father is looking for those who will worship him that way, for God is spirit. So those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said, I know that the Messiah is coming, the one who is called Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. Just then his disciples came back and they were shocked to find him talking to a woman. But none of them had the nerve to ask, do what you want with her. Oh, why are you talking to her? And the woman left the water jar beside the well and ran back to the village, telling everyone, come and see. A man who told me everything I ever did, could he possibly be the Messiah? So the people came streaming from the village to see him and so forth. They all turned out. Isn't that wonderful? And then it speaks about the harvest, verse 35. You know the saying, these are the words of Jesus, Four months between planting and harvest, that's the natural harvest, see? Those who are farmers know that. But I say, wake up and look around. The fields are already ripe for harvest. And then, verse 39, many Samaritans from the village believed in Jesus because the woman had said, he told me everything I ever did. When they came out to see him, they begged him to stay in the village. So he stayed for two days, long enough for many more to hear the message and believe. 
Then they said to the woman, now we believe not just because of what you told us, but, but because we have heard him ourselves, now we know that he is indeed the savior of the world. I tell you, evolution is taught as fact in, in, our, in our schools. Kids don't know who Jesus Christ is. Society has um, very much um, changing their view on faith. We hear all these different things on the television, uh, doom and gloom. But I tell you, the Church of Jesus Christ is the greatest message ever, one of love and compassion and forgiveness and a fresh start. I love those verses. Huh? I will transform the valley of trouble into a gateway of hope. Hallelujah. I tell you, we have got a message. And so, you know, we have many opportunities. This church has been here for many years. It will be here for many years to come. But I tell you, this week is an opportunity to say to people in a fun way, come and see, come and see. Well, I, I'm sure that you've been involved in fun weeks before, but they really are good fun. They're really so easy. That's why I love about them, because they're not confrontive evangelism. They're alongside. And so, what you know, last time when we came, it was the year before last now, in the summer, I'm not exaggerating, we would have had 300 people come every day. I tell you what, the place was absolutely packed out. And it was wonderful to do those acts of kindness and diff different things, and basically, it's just playing with the kids. We'll have the bouncy castles up, we'll have face painting, and all those different things, um, you know, Lego, and goodness knows what. And it's basically helping to do that, because I know last time, you know, just to, ke to keep up with the teas and coffees was hard work, just to welcome people at the door, because we were inundated with so many and so few of us. And so there's always something somebody can do. And also, don't miss out that you, surely, in your circle of influence, will have friends and family that need to hear the message as well. So bring them. So it's very easy. When people come in, they just offered, would you like a cup of tea, a coffee? Would you like a drink of squash? What about your little one? Would they like to have their face painted? You know, whatever, whatever. You know, in the mission that we just finished two days ago, it was amazing. Because <laughs> some of the team had this idea of having a fancy dress with actually bin liners. I tell you what, I have never seen such posh, fancy dress with bin liners. And I tell you what, there were about 30 kids who took part in this, and there were a couple of boys, and, and uh, mostly girls, and they were only dutts, you know, maybe from three to about eight years of age. Well, I tell you what, I never thought that an Aldi's white big bill, uh, bin liner with a yellow band could look so beautiful. And then they'd face painted their faces to match the bin light liners, and then they had to do it around the catwalk. Well, I tell you, the people just loved it. And then they did a twirl, and then they had a prize, and it was just so easy and wonderful. You know, there's a lovely girl called Tracy, a hairdresser. And what you'll find is, it's great we're having it for a couple of days because people will come once and they love it so much and people are looking now what are we going to do on holidays you know when two of the ladies came all the way from Tonopandi and one had four children she said yesterday I went to a, a fun day in the park in Pontypridd and she said I cost me 40 pounds for my four children she said two pound 50 each of their face painted and I think it was as much to go in the bouncy castle but we're doing it all free and so she brought her kids then, and Tracy, this hairdresser, she was lovely, and a single mum, I believe, and you know, she had a little boy, 10, Gavin, and he had autism. But I tell you, he just loved the football tournament, and he could just get connected with it. And she couldn't understand how he suffered so greatly with autism, and yet he was able to connect with the young people playing football. And you know, her life was touched so much that she came back the next day, and she brought him, and she brought her sister and her sister's daughter. And she said, my sister would like prayer. Could we have a healing clinic there as well? And people, I tell you, when people are prayed for in the name of Jesus, something always happens. <coughs> And through that growing up of that friendship then, by the next day, I chatted with Tracy and I said, Tracy, you know, what about faith? And I asked her, would she like to know Jesus? And I gave her a short presentation of the gospel. Oh, she said, yes, yes, please, she said. I knew, she said, there was some reason why I came yesterday. Oh, yes, please, she said. And I tell you what, it was a privilege to lead Tracy to Jesus. And now this week, I'll ring her and say, Tracy, how's it going? And she lives a little bit away from the village I live in. So I've already arranged for the Elim Church in Pontypridd, the pastor's wife there, to meet with her. We'll have a coffee together, and I trust I will follow up. 
And then the other folks then that I could see are really shown an interest by God's grace will start a house church in that village because now there is no house, there is no church in that village. Do you know this terrible sadness we had in Tunisia? Wasn't it awful? And you know, some of the folks that were shot were Welsh. And one of the young men that was shot was from Trihavod, my village. And he was the one that had, had protected his wife that apparently was shot three times. And you know who came to the fun day? The wife with the two children. She said, it's the first time that I ventured out of the house. And this lady, uh, uh, she came and she said, my husband was shot three times. Three times, his heart actually stopped um, twice during the operation. She said, I know that somebody up there was looking after us because the medical profession said that neither of us should have lived. But you know, she came to the fun day and one of the lovely ladies was able to pray for her. So I tell you, it's not hard sell evangelism. Please don't be nervous about it. It's just coming and loving people. It's opening a conversation. Well, I tell you what, as well as can talk. And um, I tell you what, so all we're going to do is talk about the weather. I tell you what, we could talk about the weather forever. So if you're not quite sure how to start off, just say, oh, it's a bad day today, it's a good day today, it's wet today, it's snowing today, and I tell you what, you're in. And, but you know what? It's not, it's not a hard sell. So I know for myself, when I chat with people the first day or two, I, I'm just making friends with them. And what you find is people like to talk. I got one friend who, <laughs> um, she's been a minister for quite a while in Liverpool, and uh, with the Methodist Church, and they, they said, okay, she was given the appointment, they wanted her to change the front of the church in, into a, like a coffee area, so she arranged all that. And then I went up there one day, and she had a notice in the window, and they put on it, um, she put on it, listening service. So I said to her, what's unusual, sir? What's our listening service? Who listens? She said, I do. She said, people come in and I listen to them and then they listen to me and I lead them to Jesus. But you see, two years, one mouth, we should speak um, half the time is that we listen. For me, I'm still, still practicing that because to speak is my occupation, and my, not my occupation, my hobby, my love. Anyway, you know this lady, there she was, this lady, and she didn't have a good reputation. She didn't have a, she didn't have a good world record. And I tell you what, the people in Samaria knew about her. They knew that she'd be married five times, the man she was living with. That's a bit, bit like Wales, isn't it? A bit like Wales, you know, everybody's business. I know it's the same in North Wales and South Wales. I tell you what, in our village, they all knew who came, who went, and everything. <laughs> I know we've got a knack in five minutes of knowing everybody's business. I know in Welsh, I know. Anyway, this dear lady, there she was, and she went to collect the water in the middle of the day, which really was ridiculous because it was so hot. And to carry that water in the middle of the day, which is so hot, made it was harder. But she didn't want to see her neighbours because she had a bad reputation. But, you know, we all want a church of a million. We all want an evangelistic organisation for a million. But I tell you the truth, God cares about the one. And if we don't care about the one, you can forget it. And right through the Bible, you'll find out Jesus met the one. And he took time to be by the well of Samaria. He was tired, weary. The disciples went shopping. And there he was. And uh, this lady turns up. And do you know what was lovely? He didn't say to her, oh, you're a bad woman. You've had all these husbands. And now the man you're living with is not your husband. He said, please give me a drink. She was surprised because she a lady, he a gentleman. She a Samaritan, a mixed-blooded race. He a Jew. And she said, well, Jewish people, of course, wouldn't mix with the Samaritans. They wouldn't drink out of the same cup, etc. But you see, he was building that communication. And then, you know, the conversation goes on and he says, you know, I could, you could have living water that you wouldn't be thirsty again. And then she took the mickey. And she said, oh, that's good, she said, because I won't have to come here to draw water. Of course, we know the, the water board wasn't invented then. And then what happened was as well, then the conversation goes on. And then uh, when people get hot under the cover, uh, the, the hot under the whatever, I tell you what, they, <laughs> do you know what happens is they turn the subject to religion. And so she said, well, surely the true worshippers worship on this mountain, that one on the other one. But you know, the secret of sharing your faith is to continue gently, to continue gently, to listen to the person gently. And the gift of evangelism is knowing where to leave it there or to continue with it. Anyway, what happened was she had a revelation. See, the Bible says that somebody can only come to Jesus unless the Holy Spirit draws them. 
We can't save anybody, but we're God's messengers. So we have to be very careful that we don't leave them in a way that they never, ever want to speak to a Christian again. But they think, oh my goodness, those Christians, there's something very special about them. So anyway, to cut a long story short, and I'll try to cut it short, there they were now, and suddenly she has a revelation, and that changed the perspective of, of her need and what she needed to do. Now, water is very important. If you don't drink water, you're dead. But I tell you, for that moment, she laid down uh, her priorities for that moment, and she ran into the town, and she said, come and see a man who's told me everything I've ever done. Can this be the Christ? Because in between, of course, he said, yes, of course. Because he said to her, go and call your husband. No way, and she didn't have one. But didn't, didn't he do it in a nice, nice way? And I love, you know, about uh, the gift of prophecy. And I love that we, we can sort of give prophetic words, but we have to be very careful how we give them. And you know what's wonderful is? That one woman with a bad reputation, she ran into the town, and then a lot of people came out. And then they met Jesus, and she said to them, come and see, come and see. So this week, we're just saying, come and see. We've got a great event in Boston Spa, and it's free, and there's loads of activities for the children. And even in the night, you know, it's only for one hour, and there's live music, and uh, it's, it's, it's uplifting, and there's two stories, and, you know, Jesus can heal people. Do you know, last Sunday, we saw, I was in Merthyr Tidville Sunday night, and by God's grace, the healing power of Jesus came upon the meeting. It was very encouraging. And there was a lady there, Andrea, that was partially deaf. Jesus uh, helped her, and she just got up at the end, and she said, well, I can hear now. And there was a, a gentleman that I've known for a very long time. He's probably about, about 42, 45 now. But excuse me saying it, he'd been incontinent for 20 years. Well, he contacted me some days later and said, Marilyn, I have been healed. After 20 years of being incontinent, I have been healed. I tell you what, the healing power of God. You know, there was a man in Tonopandi, not a man in Tonopandi, and he had a headache uh, for 10 years. And he'd gone to the doctor and... The doctor said, you have a problem with the white matter of your brain, so we will give you painkillers. But during those 10 years, although he had painkillers, the pain never left him. So he was in a bit of a state, but he loved Jesus. And so anyway, he was prayed for in the name of Jesus, and that headache completely went. And I met him a few months ago, has never come back. And that was about 18 months ago. He, I said, have you been back for your repeat scan? Yes, he said. Now they say there's nothing wrong with the white matter of my brain. It might, must have been we took a wrong reading. So he said, well, he said, wasn't it right that the professor did all the deliberations or whatever? And uh, so, you know, Jesus heals today. And I am just looking forward to seeing a lot of people healed. You know, yesterday when we arrived, we had a lovely meal made in the Baptist church. And the a lovely lady there called Anwen and her husband Bill, they helped to serve us. Well, Anwen was healed the last time we came. She was healed. And do you know what's amazing was, uh, I know that Kathleen, the pastor's wife, had said to me, there's a lady coming, Marilyn, and she really believes she's going to be healed. So that faith was already in her heart, and she's still healed, look. And there she was serving us last night. Anyway, come and see. Come and see that God is good. Come and see, be uplifted. That there's hope, you know, at the end of the tunnel. That I tell you, God can heal you. God can touch you. Not just saying, you know, you come to Jesus and the next thing, you, you know, you'll be a multimillionaire or you'll never have a problem in your life. You might have a couple more. But I tell you what, you, re you will receive a forgiveness and a cleansing and a hope and a forgiveness that nothing and no one can ever take away. See, I loved, we, we sang this morning again about the cross. I love to preach about the cross. Well, let me finish with a story. I do love stories. I hope you don't mind. This is, not a, this is not my own story, but I loved it so much I love to say about it. There was a boy and he was lost in the park. And it was very late, but there was a very kind, well-working police officer and he had a torch. So he was looking now and he seen the little boy and the little boy was in the hedge and he said, little boy, what are you doing out so late? Oh, the little boy said, sir, he said, I'm lost and I don't know my way home. So the police officer was very kind, so he tried to help the little boy. He said, well, do you know that block of flats? Do you know where those shops are? Do you know where those houses are? But the little boy just 
didn't know. And then suddenly, the police officer remembered. There was a church not too far away, and on top of the church, they had a big cross. So he said to the little boy, uh, do you know where that church is? The church with a big cross. And so the little boy said, his eyes lit up, and he began to smile. He said, sir, yes, I know where the cross is. He said, sir, if you can take me to the cross, then I can find my way home. And I tell you, it isn't that people do not want to know today, but I tell you, they're lost in the brambles, and they don't know there's such a place as the cross. They don't know there's such a place of coming home. And I tell you, the cross is incredibly important. Because we know the cross where Jesus died and shed his precious blood, as we remembered when we took communion this morning. And we know that the cross, the place also Jesus died, that we might be forgiven, a sacrificial death. It's an incredible place of forgiveness. Oh my gosh, forgiveness. A place of freedom from guilt. A place of hope. A place of new beginnings. And if we keep all the good news of Jesus Christ to ourselves. And we do not tell this life-changing message in our communities. God help us. No wonder the Bible says, he who wins souls is wise. Because the only thing we can take to heaven are the people we won for Jesus. And I don't know about you. I don't want to go empty-handed. Now, I know we come into this world and we don't have no money. And we go out of this world in the same. And we can't take our wealth with us. But I tell you, all we can do is we can affect people in the life of eternity to find Jesus Christ. Christ is our saviour. And I, I know I'm a bit like dramatic, but I would really urge you with all my heart you're in all your head to again take hold of that gospel message and proclaim it high and low in your community. That doesn't mean you've got to beat people down, you know, with a, a nasty presentation of the gospel, but it's a gospel, gospel of love, compassion, God cares for you. Like the girl said, surprised. I'm not surprised at all because people are far more open than we think. But how about you? Have you come to the cross? Maybe you like coming to the church and say, oh, you know, they're so friendly. And um, you know what's lovely is they really believe it. You know what they are, they are singing about. And you know, I love the music and I love everything else. But have you come to the cross? Because it's amazing we can be sat in church and we've never come to the cross. See, to come to the cross means we've come to a place of repentance. Now, repentance looks like something. And repentance is a change of mind, it's a change of heart, it's a change of decision. So when we come to that cross, we admit that we've done wrong, and we are sorry about it. We admit we've made mistakes. I tell you what, I could put three hands up and say I've made mistakes, and God even got two. Because all have sinned, the Bible says, and fallen short of God's standards. So we need to admit we've done wrong, Believe who Jesus Christ is God's son and commit our life to him. The Bible speaks about confessing our sins to him. It doesn't mean you've got to confess to you know that's every single sin you've done in your life, otherwise you'll be here till next year. But in an attitude of confession, A, B, C, admit, believe, confess. And that word, that important word, repentance. Repentance looks like something. And you know, when we come to that cross, we receive his forgiveness. We receive hope. We receive a message of a new beginning.